Now may I request Professor Pradeep Dotto to come up on dais. Professor Dotto is a renowned professor from Mechanical Engineering Department, IIC Bangalore. I am requesting Professor Dotto to deliver his speech on sustainable energy in the Indian context, scope for innovation and R&D. Please come. Nothing can be more pleasant for me to introduce uh, Professor Pradeep Dutta. Uh, it is easy at the same time very difficult because what can I say about Professor Dutta? I have been mentored by him from my early days of my research as a PhD supervisor and beyond and whatever I could learn about how to do research is because of him only. Uh, I would first like to give a little bit of formal introduction about Professor Dutta. Uh, I am sorry I am not looking into any notes about introducing Professor Dutta because I believe I know most of this. Uh, Professor Dutta graduated from the Mechanical Engineering Department of IIT Kharagpur uh, in the year 1983. Then with a brief industrial experience, uh, he joined IIT Madras for his master's studies and uh, possibly completed in 1987. And uh, then uh, Professor Datta went to Columbia University, USA for his doctoral research. He completed MPhil in 1990 and PhD in 1992. I can remember these two years because these are the two years when I completed my school final and higher secondary. So, <laughs> it is easy for me to remember. So, uh, Professor Datta has been pioneer in many things in India. Professor Datta started research on transport phenomena in materials processing in India in terms of CFD analysis. I do not think there was any researcher before Professor Datta who was working seriously on this topic. Later on, Professor Datta diversified in many other research areas. He has been a pioneer in process heat transfer and beyond. And uh, he uh, gave leadership in developing an outstanding research facility on semi-solid materials processing at IISC Bangalore, a very unique facility of this kind. Professor Datta subsequently uh, ventured into research endeavors in energy systems and energy storage systems also with particular emphasis on solar energy. He has given outstanding leadership to a high level international mission on solar energy and uh, this was uh, generously funded by the Indo-US Science and Technology Forum. Because of his outstanding contribution, Professor Datta has been bestowed with many awards and fellowships. Uh, he is a fellow of all the Indian National Academies of Science and also the Indian National Academy of Engineering. But I think we, his students of Professor Datta will always remember his contribution as an outstanding research mentor and for uh, as a recognition of this contribution he has also received the teacher best teacher award from one of the national academies of science i would not extend this anymore because it will take away some time for lunch and i would request professor datta to start uh, delivering his lecture. Thank you, Suman, for the very nice, uh, kind introduction. I do not know whether I uh, deserve such a long introduction uh, here. And uh, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me, uh, especially uh, Professor Himanti Chattopadhyay, Professor Sudipto De, and others. Um, I don't know if I'm audible, yeah. So, uh, 
I'll just begin my talk and I know I'm standing between you and uh, lunch, so I will not uh, spend more time on this. Uh, the title may be a bit misleading, but I will try to do justice to it as far as uh, possible. Uh, now, when we talk about clean energy options uh, that any society would have or and at the moment what uh, country like India is also uh, facing, uh, we have uh, the clean energy option first in the generation of the clean energy itself and uh, that has to do with renewables and we have been talking about it uh, and everybody in this room definitely uh, would uh, like to uh, uh, be part of it and uh, we are uh, uh, trying to do our best to contribute towards it. And the other thing that we should not be forgotten is since the usage of fossil fuels not going to go away so soon and we are definitely trying to reduce it, but the cleaner usage of such fuel is also part of the agenda. Then the uh, or the cleaner generation of it. And then the cleaner usage of the energy in various applications, I uh, am just listing out a few of them, which is uh, electric vehicles, uh, hybrid vehicles, uh, fuel cells, which could be methanol based uh, uh, or hydrogen based as usual. So, this kind of uh, clean energy thrust has been there in the, in the, uh, in the world and uh, very much now in India. Uh, but this thrust of clean energy, uh, why it is important for a country like India as it was discussed in the, uh, during the panel discussion also that there is a direct correlation between human development index and electric consumption and this is uh, UN, uh, based on UN data and this data keeps shifting a little bit but the trend uh, what is presented here though it is dated still stays the same which means that the uh, the here the bottom the x axis is actually the electricity con uh, consumption uh, per kilowatt hour per person per year and this is the hdi and uh, as you see here these are most of the developed countries over here uh, there is a high a this is a hd index not h index uh, hdi mm, and uh, this is uh, uh, with a with a cost of uh, high electricity consumption so, uh, India is somewhere here where the human development index is not very high and if you look at the per cap capita electricity consumption is also on the lower side. Uh, so, so, this part of the graph is where the HDI is strongly dependent on electricity use and this part where it is unaffected by the change, it is the, we can say kind of a uh, saturation as far as HDI is concerned, but more and more energy is being used. Ideally. Uh, uh, we should belong uh, somewhere here where we can reach a high age index, uh, HI, HD, HD index uh, without cost of uh, energy usage so much. Now, if we have to do that, uh, just uh, simple arithmetic with the population and the kind of uh, uh, energy that we would use for, uh, we would use for high uh, uh, human development index. It turns out that uh, with given the resources, it is the solar and the nuclear are perhaps the only two which can meet the capacity that would be. There will be other contributions from uh, wind and other uh, resources as well uh, and given the land mass. But making energy such as solar energy cost effective is always a challenge and it is a necessity that we have. Now, Given the resources that India has, especially in some parts of India, the DNI is quite high, the direct normal in irradiance, with, uh, and the kind of land that we have and the DNI, it is uh, any calculation will say that even 1 percent of this can be enough to uh, provide our necessity, but this is easier said that, than done because uh, cost is a major issue and together with that what I am going to bring in is the sustainability part as well. Now the question is why is renewable energy so expensive or why we are talk about, talking about sustainability in this. Uh, now this is not a technical talk uh, very much but I would like to bring in 
that the, even though the energy source is free, the answer to that actually lies in our uh, fundamentals, which is our second law of thermodynamics. And the reason is that in the, according to the second law, energy has quantity as well as quality. And when we are talking about renewable sources, the energy density is actually quite low. So there is much lower potential to generate the electricity, especially when you, because electricity is the highest form of energy or highest degree of energy that you will have. And the low grade heat or low grade wind would be the, one of the lowest ones that is available to us. So the, the, therefore, to, the conversion efficiency is always quite low. And, and that's why we say that renewable sources have low power densities. For instance, if you consider with some equivalence, uh, coal or oil will have about 40 times you know, more energy density compared to the solar that is available on, on land, the form that we are able to get. Now, the, if you, what do you mean by quality of energy? Let us give, uh, um, if there are students over here, they will uh, appreciate that if we take thermal as an example and if you run a Carnot engine operating at different temperatures, but with the same amount of heat, something with a source of 1000 degrees Celsius, which is typically available with fossil fuel, you can have a Carnot with a 100 kilowatt conversion, uh, you can have an electricity output of 76 kilowatt uh, electricity uh, with an environment of 35 degrees Celsius. And the same exercise if we do with a 50 kilowatt heat source, uh, with 100 kilowatt conversion will give you only 5% efficiency. Uh, interacting with the same environment. So 1000 degree refers to the typical temperature realized from fossil fuels and 50 degrees actually from a, a flat plate solar collector without concentration I am talking about. So that is the kind of thing. So high temperature uh, heat, it refers to high quality and therefore higher grade energy. Now what do we do is when we want to convert solar energy into something realizable as electrical energy which is the highest form we have to convert this low grade by concentrating the energy and convert it to high grade. And this concentration of course requires a large area to a small area, which means we require a lot of material, lot of uh, very expensive material to do that. This is a solar thermal or the CSP example. And what we mean is when we invest material, we are talking about a capital cost. And then uh, this capital cost is actually what determines the cost of uh, a renewable energy, that is our levelized cost of electricity because most of it is capital cost because the resource otherwise is free. So this is levelized over the lifetime of the plant, uh, maybe 20 or 25 years and what we pay for electricity is that. Then similar exercise can be done in the case of photovoltaic, we actually invest in very expensive material uh, upgradation. Uh, produce silicon and any other new types of materials also being invented. In the case of wind, we invest in large turbine system to convert from a very low RPM into a high RPM uh, because the catchment of wind has to be very high. So in all, uh, what we have there is that it needs investment uh, in capital investment. So in view of this, uh, in around 2010, actually this uh, our national solar mission was launched with a, at, at that time quite an aggressive target of 20 gigawatts by 2022 and there was a very high tariff that was proposed because at that time solar energy was quite expensive. Now under the solar mission at that time, uh, there was very positive response from industry uh, but mostly uh, from, the, uh, from the photovoltaic but much weaker from the uh, solar thermal and the reason for that was that although the projection of the cost of the LCOE uh, projection, uh, this is starting year was 2009 and the projection was that the photovoltaic uh, cost, uh, the LCOE in rupees per kilowatt hour would go from around 15 uh, all the way we would have some grid parity around uh, 8 or 9 years later that was uh, 2018. Uh, and solar thermal also had a similar pathway, similar projection. But it so happened that uh, after a few years, there was a sudden decrease uh, in 2012, uh, around 2012 decrease of the cost of uh, putting up panels 
uh, and th that was mainly because uh, of the ch uh, Chinese, uh, they were able to uh, reduce the cost drastically. And then uh, with this non-linearity, which was not really technological breakthrough, but scaling up and reducing cost and subsi giving subsidies, many other factors were there. And uh, it was, it suddenly became affordable. And then what happened was uh, there were other parts of the world where uh, solar panel manufacturers had to close down their shops because they couldn't compete and uh, dumping, anti-dumping uh, uh, anti uh, tariffs were raised in, in US and therefore uh, uh, then in India also at that point at time we went the other way, we, thought, we saw it's an opportunity to deploy in large scale uh, uh, solar uh, PV and then uh, around the mission target in 2014 was revised to 100 gigawatt by 2022 and we are almost achieving that target today. In 2016, the prices plunged down further and it went down below 3 per uh, unit. And uh, in March 2019, another uh, landmark was that there was a formal launch of uh, International uh, Solar uh, Alliance. So a lot of progress, but let us look at uh, the photovoltaic uh, cost uh, because those are all uh, stories about uh, mostly imported uh, PV panels. Now we want to look at the manufacturing versus imports. Uh, this is just a comparison of as a breakdown of uh, various cost uh, components in the case of the photovoltaic uh, from cell all the way to uh, uh, the other balance of plants. And this uh, source is uh, from a C-STEP which is a think tank organization doing policy analysis. And if you look at the Indian cost and Chinese cost, the balance of plant cost, India is as competitive or sometimes even better, but in the case of silicon cell, where we uh, score, uh, I mean our costs are much higher than China. So therefore, as a package, we are not able to compete much. Uh, similarly, US of course, this is based on thin film technology, uh, but these are the polysilicon based uh, uh, technology that India and China we are comparing. So therefore, that is where uh, the problem lies. So the photovoltaic in India today is highly import dependent and uh, uh, in fact two days back in Economic Times uh, there was an article, it was February 12, 2020 that the coronavirus is causing problem uh, in our deployment of so, uh, solar energy in India uh, and, uh, and it also says that uh, about because the, the, at the outbreak of the coronavirus, it's upsetting the schedule uh, as procurement is getting delayed from, from China and uh, Taiwan and so on. And also it says that 90% of these modules uh, used here are imported from China and Malaysia. So this is the truth. Uh, so this deployment target definitely can be met with imported PV panels, uh, but with those, now it is not like importing a machine tool where you import the machine and then you're going to produce for so many, many years. Uh, so the, there's a capital cost, but uh, there is also a running cost. So the capital cost component is not much. Uh, but in this particular case, uh, in the case of solar PV, actually the capital cost is what determines your final cost of electricity. So if that is imported, then it's almost like uh, every unit of electricity we are basically getting from another country uh, because, because the cost that we are paying is actually over the lifetime of the plant. Uh, so this could be as far as trade balance is concerned, not otherwise, not environment wise, trade balance is much worse than our oil import in the future once it is scaled up. Now this brings us to the context of the sustainability in energy and so when you want to analyze sustainability energy, there is the energy source factor and there is a requirement issue also. Hmm. Now as far as the energy source is concerned, uh, if, if the source is a fuel, fossil fuel or nuclear, then fuel availability is an issue. Hmm. But as far as renewable is concerned, the energy source availability is not an issue. Okay, there is adequate, otherwise you will not choose that form of energy. So, Whereas the requirement in order for, for sustaining is the technology, it's the materials and whether we are able to manufacture or not. 
at even if we don't manufacture everything, how much of value addition that we are going to put is the real question here. So at that time when the solar mission was launched in 2010, the recommendation of local manufacturing for sustainability was there as uh, and it was highlighted. So the, if you look at the original solar mission objectives and solar mission was actually the main architect was Mr. Sham Saran, uh, at that point of time he was the, uh, uh, the principal uh, uh, advisor to uh, or uh, for PM for the prime minister. So deployment was definitely a, a, an object objective, uh, but R it was mentioned major R&D effort uh, and a roadmap towards indigenization, indigenization was also there and, uh, and also 6 to 8 hours of storage. And I will come to the point why storage was emphasized. Uh, then hybrid solutions that coupling solar with other forms of energy uh, was also recommended and the mission recognized that solar power is most suited for decentralized. When you talk about decentralized, that is where the storage comes into the picture because it is not just about feeding the grid. Now, uh, two years back, uh, we, when we signed the International Solar Alliance, uh, uh, then Mr. Samsaran made this comment at that point of time, uh, appreciated the major initiative taken by the government and but the original mission uh, objective, uh, some of it was not seriously pursued, he brought it up and, it, and in that original mission what was uh, inked at that time was that India should become a technology leader in the sector and uh, China is already laying claim to that position and investing heavily on R&D and that is where this industry academia uh, collaboration becomes very important because it is not just a question of buying from somewhere and deploying. It is are we ready for uh, indigenization through innovation uh, and so coming back to this age, human de development index, uh, if we want to reach there, uh, what we need for sustainability is that do we build India centric technologies? Well, that question is, uh, I am not uh, trying to sound like a Swadeshi uh, movement champion, but when you talk about renewables, the renewable, the source is local, so therefore there are sometimes solutions which are local, solutions which may be elsewhere uh, effective, it may not be effective here and something else may be, that's why there are certain India centric things to be developed. Uh, for instance, even these photovoltaic panels, you know, because of dusty environment, humid environment, uh, they are not performing as well as they are performing in Germany or France. Uh, but not uh, because those are much cleaner environments and uh, colder. So, so that's the kind of thing that we need to think about. Uh, what is needed is affordability, reliability and sustainability. Then we need the leadership in complete solar value chain. Uh, that means that even if certain things are imported, but we should be able to pro provide enough value addition in terms of manufacturing that should lead towards employment as well. Uh, um, then innovation and all this require major R&D effort and need for active involvement in industry, academia and uh, the government. Then uh, I am basically from the uh, thermal engineering side, so I will talk a little bit about some initiatives on the thermal side uh, that have been taken. Uh, just a little bit of glimpse for people who are from other fields that what is concentrating solar power is actually is just like any other power plant except that the uh, uh, ex ex except uh, ex except that the uh, heat source is solar concentrated solar realizing that kind of temperature which a fossil fuel realizes through a receiver after concentration and then that operates a heat engine and that heat engine part is same as any other kind of a power plant. And there are many types of technologies which are basically f used for concentration of the solar energy, uh, the line focusing and the point focusing ones. But I will not go into the details of those, those are textbook matters and there is quite a bit of development uh, history starting from the 1970s. Uh, all the way to uh, the present day which is led to a large extent by the Sunshot initiative by the uh, by US Department of Energy 
and uh, also there are a uh, lot of initiatives being taken in Europe, especially in Spain and Germany. Uh, and today there is a large power plant, the largest one that is operating uh, in uh, Ivanpa uh, in California, uh, which is, no this is Crescent Dunes, but the Ivanpa is over here, 390 megawatt electricity uh, that was established in 2014. Now, there are many disadvantages of CSP, especially when it is trying to compete with other forms of energy. Uh, price, uh, it needs very precise uh, on-site engineering because if you are a little bit way off, then the efficiency can fall down. Cost, and, uh, cost is a very uh, uh, important issue and it becomes effective only at a very large scale like 100 megawatt plant uh, to be cost comp competitive, if at all with the present technologies. Then at the distributed scale, you know, where, uh, which matters a lot in a country like India, uh, if we have a steam based power plant for CSP, it is not uh, as cost effective as because of the kind of efficiency and also then many other issues. Now with storage or hybridization, then the cost comparison picture changes. Why it is? Because when you invest on storage, uh, in the case of thermal, actually the power plant capacity you do not have to Im increase, but at the same time your total energy output or the capacity utilization can be much higher. Uh, but the, so the cost of storage actually is the cost of the extra field plus the storage material and in the case of photovoltaic it is the extra panels but uh, plus battery. Uh, so in the CSP the cost of the power block actually does not change at all with, with storage and that is the advantage it can take uh, in terms of LCOE with storage. Uh, then what we are talking about distributed form of solar energy and uh, issue of storage, uh, let us look at solar in the central and distributed mode. We have, uh, these are various uh, forms of energy uh, that is there uh, already uh, without solar and uh, we feed into the grid and then finally we use it, this is at the point of use in form of lighting uh, all the way to kitchen. Now when we want to put in solar also uh, in this energy mix for the grid, for the large scale it can directly feed into the grid and when we do the distributed we have a choice of feeding into the grid and also directly use in a community. So that is where uh, in a place like India where every place is not grid connected and it makes, uh, doesn't make sense uh, everywhere uh, in a place like Ladakh uh, or remote places uh, because it's not cost effective to have grid connection then this distributed solar in any form uh, is going to be very useful. Now for this the technology is fairly mature uh, especially abroad uh, it is mature but for the distributed it is not as mature and that is a space that we have in terms of R&D and innovation which must be utilized by uh, uh, in academia industry collaboration. Uh, now when it comes to the steam based distributed power uh, as I mentioned it was it is viable for large scale generally because your uh, turbine efficiency will fall drastically when it uh, with scale down penalty when you come down to the megawatt or even kilowatt scale uh, scales. And also in the large scale, uh, large blocks of land which is difficult to acquire and there are socio-economic issues and sometimes bits and pieces we get lands. Uh, then it can also be water intensive because it has to depend on cooling tower especially uh, otherwise the efficiency falls down. Hmm. So this is the viability of steam based power plant uh, is not much in the case of distributed solar thermal. And that is where innovative or disruptive technology is required and the potential ones which uh, we have worked on is one of them is the supercritical CO2 based Breton cycle and I will give you a brief background of it uh, which, and this has potential of more than 50 percent cycle efficiency, the thermodynamic cycle efficiency even at 700 degrees uh, receiver temperature. Uh, this is also being developed for the nuclear power plants as well. Uh, I will uh, give you, uh, I will bring that uh, uh, context uh, through a simple cost arithmetic. So if this is a typical, you know, 
5 megawatt parabolic trough cost breakup of a uh, solar thermal power plant and it turns out that the solar field cost is about 50 to 60 percent and the rest is the power block part. Uh, so the solar field we cannot do much about it, there is lot of improvement that is taking place though, but as far as cost is concerned, if we focus on the power plant side, we can have a high efficiency increase because if you have efficient increase, you automatically this size comes down. So there is a dual effect as far as cost reduction is concerned. And for this, new cycles or disruptive technologies, new engines, there is scope. And that is where I am uh, coming to. And uh, when you want to, of course, uh, uh, that we have covered. In this context, uh, I would like to just share some of our experience uh, at IISC and in India, what we had. Uh, recently, we just completed a major project on uh, the Indo-US uh, consortium on solar energy uh, funded by DOE and Department of Science and Technology by Government of India. And we had this consortium named as uh, Sirius. Uh, led by NREL and led by ISC uh, on the India side. Uh, now, now this, the major objective uh, was to cater to both the Sunshot initiative as well as our uh, solar mission. And we had a large number of uh, collaborators, uh, 34 partners among industries, academia as well as R&D institutions. Now, we had three thrusts, this was the policy side and we had the thrust on the photovoltaic and also the solar thermal. Now I am going to talk a little bit about this, uh, the major outcome on this uh, solar power uh, on the uh, CSP side. Uh, so we had uh, you know, disruptive technologies being developed in collaboration uh, with various institutions on the heliostat side receiver, storage on the power block and so on. Finally, target was to reduce the cost and make it sustainable also. I will not dwell too much on that except that just introduce you to this new disruptive technology on the power plant side uh, which is taking place across the world now and in India we are also one of the pioneers. Uh, the it, as we mentioned that it is a high efficiency and very compact power block. If you see the size of a turbine, uh, this is for a 20, uh, 10 megawatt scale, uh, this is the size of a equivalent steam turbine mm. and this is the uh, turbine generator system and this is the turbine system of a supercritical CO2 same capacity. It is about a 10th to 20th of it and it is very and it can offer dry cooling and the main reason is that uh, the, the temperature uh, exit temperature from turbine is high enough we do heat recovery from there and we do not necessarily need water to cool and then it is fairly versatile for various heat sources. Uh, then scale down penalty is also lower to megawatt scale also it can, uh, it can work well. Uh, there are a lot of initiatives across the world it is being take, taking place right now and it is poised to replace steam later on once it gets matured, it is still not matured, it is still at the lab level and uh, pilot plant level. Uh, it can potential to replace conventional uh, uh, steam based power plant, solar thermal power plant as well as nuclear. And uh, but there are many, uh, there are many challenges, the high temperature, high pressure receivers, then heat exchangers, regenerator and the pre-cooler, then high temperature storage system, all these are challenges which are actually being addressed by academia and industry. Uh, this is what at ISC uh, led by Professor Pramod Kumar, uh, he has built the first working uh, supercritical CO2 at the lab scale uh, a cycle uh, which, is, which is working uh, in India uh, and we are also integrating it with, uh, with solar receiver uh, for the first time in the world. Uh, we have almost done that and he has not only developed this entire uh, cycle which is quite complex uh, to realize it in re uh, real life uh, at the uh, uh, at the heating scale of about 50 kilowatt, uh, uh, he is also developing uh, with industry uh, the turbine supercritical CO2. This is with three turbines, then heat exchanger, printed circuit, microchannel heat exchanger with 
uh, with BHL and there is a major R&D program also that is being run on all of these uh, that is PAN IIT and ISC uh, on under the clean coal technologies. Uh, uh, Professor Suman Chakravarti is also involved in that one because he is a country expert in micro channels, so we are taking his help also in that one. Uh, this uh, lab was inaugurated recently by uh, Honorable Minister uh, of Science and Technology. Now, uh, just one more few, two, three minutes of uh, another uh, experience that we have had on a, let us say, polygeneration. There is another thing about sustainability is not just take a source and use it to pro pro provide electricity. Uh, thermal based sources and other sources also have the potential for polygeneration uh, that is simultaneous generation of more than two energy forms in an integrated process. This is a generalized diagram of a polygeneration system where we have multiple sources, it could be biomass, it could be solar, it could be wind. Uh, a photovoltaic system also and then uh, and there are number of outputs so that nothing is wasted or as far as possible we make use of everything. So this is another branch of study in Europe it is very uh, much more advanced and they make use of it and in India we are trying to catch on uh, with that end to end utilization. So one of the examples that we have done is uh, one adsorption based cooling and desalination where we are using solar energy to drive a cooling unit. Normally a cooling unit uh, like a chill water production will require a mechanical compressor and then a communication with the environment for condensation. Right. What we are doing is we are replacing the mechanical compressor with a solar heat based uh, thermal compressor. It can, you can have an absorption or vapor absorption based, we are, what we are using is an adsorption based. And then what we are doing is uh, if we are using brackish water to produce the chill water here and the, 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 the water in the evaporator which gets evaporated ultimately we can actually condense and distill and use it as a desalinated water. So that is our form of polygeneration as far as this is concerned. Uh, this is a thermal compression I will not go into this one. So what we have done is a two stage thermal compression which was the innovation over here so that we can get the water directly for desalination. So we can compress it all the way up to almost 20 kPa and then uh, use a condenser and then uh, get, the, get the water out. At the same time we get refrigeration over here. Uh, so uh, we had built one this two stage capacity which was uh, two stage uh, one kilowatt capacity first in the lab scale. Then we optimized it uh, actually uh, with a scaled up uh, with a solar field with a 10 kilowatt system. Uh, uh, using just two beds. I will not go uh, into more details because uh, it is almost lunch time. Uh, this is a photograph of the rooftop unit that has been built as a demonstration and such a thing of course when we did it, it cost quite a bit because everything was not, nothing was standardized. But when these things are standardized, uh, we believe they will, can be quite cost effective and commercialized and we are working with an industry to, uh, towards that effect. Uh, so, uh, with that I would like to uh, end and conclude over here uh, by saying that the renewable energy, there are inter India, India centric issues and needs so, and the resources are also India centric uh, which so therefore for, from a sustainable point of, point of view there should be actually indigenous manufacturing, uh, innovation, uh, employment generation, skill development and so on. Hmm. Uh, there is opportunity for R&D which is created and in also in the deployment because we have deploying, near, deploying nearly 100 gigawatt of uh, PV based uh, units and lot of uh, wind energy also. So there is also lot of uh, challenges and innovation lying in terms of smart grids uh, as well uh, on the electrical side, uh, new power cycles I just talked about. And I want to reiterate uh, what we discussed during the panel discussion that the involvement of the social science experts towards uh, long term uh, and short term policies. Uh, so thank you very much. I hope I have not exceeded my time. Uh, uh, so if there are any questions, I will be happy to answer.
So because of interest of time, we can address one question before lunch, but Professor Datta will be available during lunch time, so more questions can be addressed to him during that time. So maybe one question. Uh, very nice talk, sir. Uh, I had a question. Uh, majorly, it's related to molten salts because in India we are still are we have not used them as heat transfer fluids. We are still into the oil, which basically limits the maximum operating temperature around three or just below 400. Mm. Yes. So with molten salts, we can actually push it up to uh, say close to 600, maybe 565 or so that would have sort of increased the amount of, uh, I mean, the efficiency of the overall CSP plant. Now, is there anything that actually is stopping us from doing that? Or yeah, yeah I'll, answer, try to, I'll try to answer your question. Actually, the limitation which you talked about uh, with oil, that is also being overcome. Even in India, uh, we are working closely with uh, HPCL. Hmm. Uh, HPCL R&D is working on both the molten salt as well as their own thermic fluids, which they call as um, uh, it's, it's something HP. Uh, there's a brand name. Uh, I mean, they have a tra trade name for it. Uh, uh, they, so they are also pushing their limits up and up uh, because, uh, and they are patented these also. So molten salt, the challenge in the R&D is actually not the higher temperature side. It is actually the melting temperature. So they are working on certain eutectics, a mixture of salt such that the melting temperature is below 100 degrees. And they have almost solved the problem, they are testing, testing it. Th there so are salts which are lower than 100. Yeah, th mm -hmm. that is where the, uh, and salts which are stable, yeah. uh, that is where the upper, upper side is not the issue. For the thermic fluid, the upper side is issue, but both are being uh, looked at uh, and things are happening across the world uh, and even in India. Uh, so, uh, so HPCL is one company, maybe there are other places also they are looking at it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, we would like to thank Professor Datta for this uh, very nice presentation. I mean, it was again like I felt like I am attending his lectures again in classes. So uh, I would now leave it on to the organizers for the next announcement.